their job and the city loses, which of course, at the end of the day, you're gonna lose because the state determines whether you're in compliance or not. You're also paying their attorney's fees. So it is a no-win situation. And it's, a, from staff's perspective, and what, what happens at the end of those lawsuits? The judge tells you, hey, adopt the plan. So you either do it the easy way or you do it the hard way. We recommend we do it the easy way. Um, the, one of the biggest issues that we struggle with here in Alameda is something called Measure A. Measure A is a charter amendment. So you have a city charter. It's the original document that sort of governs how things work in Alameda. It's mostly about, hey, you're gonna have a mayor, you're gonna have a council, you're gonna have a city manager. Um, it sort of just lays out the basic structure of government in Alameda, which is all great, but it has an unusual provision. And that's a land use provision, which is not typical in a charter. It was put there in 1973 by the voters of Alameda, and they decided to add a sentence in your charter in 1973. It says, there shall be no multifamily housing built anywhere in Alameda ever again. The state of California has had issues with this for many years. It's the state law says you must allow at least some of multifamily housing. And, and the question becomes, I mean, for those of you who are kind of wondering, like, what's the big deal? I mean, multifamily housing is the how, type of housing that is affordable compared to single family housing. So why is it a problem to just say we want no multifamily housing? Because what you're really saying is if you can't afford single family housing, don't come down with me. Go somewhere else. That's the implication of that of that provision. Um, up until recently, over the last 10 or 12 years, we have been getting our housing elements certified, and we've been doing it by, by showing the state, yes, we have this prohibition, but we can tweak it a little bit in certain places so that we can provide enough housing to meet our regional housing need. That's the number of units that we have to show the state we can build in Alameda under our current zoning. So up until recently in California, that's really all you had to do with a housing element. Show that your zoning allowed housing in, in, in enough places where you provided enough units. This round, things are a little different. And it's different not just for Alameda, it's for all cities in California that there is also now a requirement that you affirmatively further fair housing and what that what the state is saying is it's time to start looking back at what has happened in your city over the last 10 20 30 40 years and and looked at at, at what sort of actions have you taken as a city over that time that has contributed to unfair housing policies, which then leads to um, sort of uh, differences in opportunity in different areas of your town, or to put it in, in sort of simpler terms, if you've got poor areas of town and rich areas of town, which is very common in most cities, you can't be just putting all your new housing and all your new affordable housing in the poor areas and say, oh, our rich areas don't have to have any more housing because they don't want it. You have to spread it around. And if you've got a history of sort of discriminating against certain types of, of people or certain income levels, you got to stop doing that and you got to address it. Affirmatively further fair housing. So this debate has been going on for years in Alameda. Like, Let's just, we want to keep Measure A. I mean, up until just two years ago, the voters of Alameda said, absolutely, we want to keep Measure A. That was Measure Z, which went down. Um, uh, the voters in Alameda was like, no, we want to keep Measure A. The state of California has written us a letter saying it is fundamentally contrary to fair housing to prohibit multifamily housing in your city. So we have, a, we have a, an issue that we have to address. This housing element says we acknowledge that that's a problem and we are going to deal with it by removing that prohibition in our multifamily housing districts. Um, 
This is going to be an issue. We're going to, I mean, we're already, there's already folks in this town who are, you know, writing the state and saying, don't, don't approve this housing element. We want to save Measure A. I mean, there's already people raising money to sue the city if this housing element gets certified. So this is going to be a, a, a fight. It's going to be a fight. Um, if you don't approve the housing element, you're going to get sued by the advocates and most likely the state of California. If you do approve a housing element, you're probably going to, the city's probably going to get sued by the people who want to preserve measure it. Um, that's what's lining up, and that's that's sort of what's at stake um, it, on this as for this next round. Um, but it's this 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 question is going to get resolved. And it's going to be resolved through this process, and most likely through the courts. Finally, um, why not just do it all at Alameda Point? It plays back to this affirmatively affirmatively furthering fair housing issue. The state has made it very clear you can't just put all of your housing in the west end of Alameda. They create the maps, we don't create the maps, they create the maps, their map shows where the low opportunity areas are and where the high opportunities areas. It's not surprising, East Alameda, Harbor Bay are high, extremely high opportunity areas. West Alameda, Alameda Point is the lowest opportunity areas. It's really a reflection of income, uh, home ownership, those kinds of things. You know, it's a problem for us here in Alameda, right? Like, all the land is out here. There's very little land in East Alameda available for more housing. It's our, our, our inventory of land is all out here in West Alameda. So what this housing element does, it says, look, we're still going to do a ton of our housing in West Alameda because that's where the land is. Um, we're talking 1,500 units of the 5,300 we have to do out here at Alameda Point. We think that's doable, but it's gonna be a huge challenge. Um, because at Alameda Point, we have the land, but we have no infrastructure. So we have to build all the infrastructure to support the housing as we're building the housing. And so that just takes a lot of time. So 1,500 housing units in eight years being built out here. I mean, we, what you see when you came in is about 500 housing units. I mean, taken us 20 years to get the first 500 years. Now we're up and running now, we got things moving, but 1,500 in eight years is going to be a massive challenge. We think we can do it. Um, we think it's an appropriate amount also in terms of the fair housing issue, um, but that's the primary reason why we don't put all the housing at Alameda Point. Um, well, the, the, I'll just wrap up just Housing also about 1,500 units at Alameda Point, West End. Um, Alameda Landing, some more housing up there. Northern Waterfront, a number of projects along the Northern Waterfront. Ensignal Terminals is good for 500 housing units. Um, the Boat Works Project, which is at Oak and Clement, that big vacant 10 acre parcel, another 182 units there. Um, Alameda Marina, which is under construction. It was a big, the new big building that's up but there's, there's units that have already been approved and not built yet, so we get to take credit for that, so along the northern waterfront. Um, a bunch of the units there. Up zoning of Park Street and Webster Street uh, to allow multifamily housing above ground floor retail. We're hoping around 400 units, 200 Webster Street, 200 Park Street. Things like converting, it. there's a, a, a few opportunity sites, not a lot. Um, and then, oh, shopping centers. Shopping centers, huge inventory of land there. So we have like five shopping centers. Um, they have, you know, half of it is parking lot. Um, this is a lot of cities in America are doing this, like adding housing to the shopping centers because shopping centers are just not what they used to be and they represent a great opportunity to add housing. It actually helps the retail to have people living right, right next to the retail. Um, so we think we can do about 800, no, um, 1,200 units between South Shore Shopping Center, Harbor Bay Shopping Center. And what's nice about those two shopping centers? High opportunity areas for the state of California. So we're showing them, look, we're building some housing in the highest opportunity areas. Um, and then uh, Alameda Landing Shopping Center and um, Marina Village Shopping Center as well. Those are sort of the four big shopping centers where we think we can get about 1,200 housing units. Um, over this period. 
And then lastly, the residential neighborhoods. Let's just talk about them for just one minute. They're, they're by far the biggest reservoir of land. We're talking 2,500 acres when you look at your R1, your R2. This is, these are the residential districts that most of you probably live in. Um, up until, since the adoption of Measure A in 1973, we stopped building housing on the, on the uh, Park Street and Webster Street. Like all the housing you see on Park Street and Webster Street above the ground floor retail, that was all built before 1973. Why is that? Well, because you adopted a land use regulation that's saying no more multifamily housing. So it has effectively killed that off. So in this day and age, it seems to make a ton of sense. That's where the transit is. That's where the shopping is. Let's build some housing above the retail on Park Street, Webster Street. Um, residential neighborhoods. Since 1973, basically all new housing effectively stopped in residential neighborhoods. Um, in 2018, the state said, hey, cities in California, you gotta loosen up your regulations on second units, on accessory dwelling units, the granny unit. You have to allow these things to happen um, with, with, under certain criteria. And so we passed those laws, just like every other city in, 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 in California. And miraculously, we've, every year since then, we've seen a gradual uptick in the number of accessory dwelling units that um, Alameda residents have been building on their property. Now these are units that are being built where there's already a home. Most of them are in a garage or in a basement um, or in a backyard. So we don't really see them, but they are happening. Um, last year, about 70 of them were added. We issued building permits for 70. It's 2,400 acres, it's 16,000 properties. So 70 sort of sprinkled among the 16,000, you probably don't really notice it. What this housing element said, hey, we, we just loosen up that and make it possible for people to add housing in these districts. We think we can squeeze another 25 or 30 units out of per year out of these 16,000. So once again, from a fair housing perspective, sort of acknowledging like, it's okay for different kinds of people to be living in all of our neighborhoods. We treat all of our neighborhoods equally. We're not trying to keep certain types of people out of certain types of neighborhoods. Um, we're trying to treat everyone the same. And that's the basic gist of, of, of our housing history. I've talked way too much. <laughs> Let's do some, yeah, I'll have a drink and then you guys ask questions. Great, let's go. Can, every, can you hear me? I can't otherwise I go to the microphone. The microphone, you got it. Okay, you got it. So, right, so what we're gonna do is this. We'll do it in, in stages. I'll just start with questions. But you can make questions. Yeah, So we have a few questions here. Um, First of all, thank you, Andrew, thank you very much. I, I think the world of Andrew. Thank you, thank you. So a number of questions were um, very similar. So what I do is I, I group them by subject matter. And that way I will read a few of the questions and Andrew, then you can respond. And then if there's any follow up from there. So some people wrote their names on the questions and some didn't, so I won't. Um, Call, call out the name of the person, of the author of the question. So the very first question is, what is the legal citation for the law that requires the housing plan? So let me say this before I pass it over to uh, Andrew. Uh, I was on the first committee that created the arena appointed by the state of California. Um, I've been a planning director for a city, redevelopment agency, executive of the state of California. This is a law that, believe it or not, Pete Wilson was an assembly person passed in the state of California. It is now being enforced. So, to that section, there are approximately 150 um, amendments to the original general plan law of 1967. 
So I have all those. So if somebody wants to email me, I'll give you all the legal citations, but you should know that right now there are 150 plus. You have a number of case law. So that is not to evade the question, but the question is what is the legal citation? Not a legal citation. There is a group of legal citations relative to the creation of this law, which began in 1967. Author was Pete Wilson, assemblyman from San Diego. So um, now for the arena, and just um, what I neglected to say at the very beginning and back to the citation, um, this is the housing element. Um, the easiest way to get a hold of a copy or to read it, just Google Alameda 2040. Just go to Google, do that. It'll take you right to the city's general plan website and that's where you'll find this document. And all those citations and the legal basis is right on page one. You'll find all that. And the RENA question was? How did it come to be? Oh, so the state has said, the state legislature, so your representatives at the, in Sacramento have determined that housing is an issue of statewide concern. An issue of statewide concern means this is so important to the state of California that every city needs to do its part to deal with it. The lack of housing, the lack of affordable housing in California is having negative effects on the lives of all Californians. Therefore, every city must step up to do its part. So, on the housing issue, what does the state require of the city to do? Number one, do the housing plan every eight years. What does that housing plan have to say? What the state does is they determine, because they were the ones who decided it was an issue of statewide concern, what the, what, the, what, the, what the staff does in Sacramento is they determine how many housing units does the state need over the next eight years. And then they divide it by region so Southern California, you need 50,000 or 500,000. The Bay Area for this eight years, it's 444,000 housing units in eight years. That's the need in California and the Bay Area. They do another, uh, the Sacramento has its region and there's, the states divide into regions. There's, an, uh, there's, an or, there's a regional planning group or, or agency for every region. Ours is called the Association of Bay Area Governments, or ABAG. They have the god-awful job of receiving the state's allocation for the Bay Area, and then deciding how to divide it among the hundred cities and counties in the Bay Area. And they go through a two-year process of establishing how do we do that, what's the formula for doing it, um, and then they implement that formula and out comes the number for each city. Our city was 5,353. Um, now, one just other clarification. Cities don't build housing, right? We don't build housing. We do have a housing authority to build some housing, but 99% of the housing in California is built by property owners, developers, owners of land. The cities don't build housing, so that's when you say you have to do a housing plan, and what's the obligation of the city? Well, it's all about our zoning and our general plan. What do we allow and where do we allow it? Um, so, and that's what the state is asking us to do with the housing plan and with the RENA. Uh, thank you. There are, are a few questions also related to RENA, but I want to get this one out of the way because this is an orphan and the person didn't sign it, so I want to make sure their question was answered. The question was, there does not seem to be a lot of housing on the Park Street corridor. Can there be more? And I know you addressed it earlier. The person that wrote this, do you, did you have your answer, your question answered? On the Park Street corridor? Yeah? Okay, all right, moving on. Okay, the next set of questions are everyone from 42% of the arena is for low and very low, 58% includes modern income, you know, the various uh, statistics. Just go to Arena site, you can see the methodology and the numbers, not only associated with Alameda, but as Andrew said, for the entire Bay Area, city by city and by county. They're all right there on one site. So this one is asking about the 42% of the low to very low income, 58%. This one is, 
How was the 5300 new unit figure derived? Who made this decision, which is Arena? This is, given the extreme housing crisis in the Bay Area, how do we maximize the amount of affordable housing, which is a number issue? And then the second part to this, which is another stack there, which we'll get to, uh, deals with transit and leveraging uh, transit funds, um, oriented transit-oriented development, and the, um, in an ingress and egress for the island. Um, and this is uh, tied to that, Given those numbers, and there's a few of these questions, we're in a drought, so how does our infrastructure and our natural resources play into the amount of housing units that the state is asking to build? So that's a, a, a host of questions that I wanted to. I'm gonna try this. All right, um, let's go back to the arena. You know, the, the, I was talking about ABAG, what a god off the job. You don't wanna work for them. Um, <laughs> That's okay. You know, every city in the Bay Area has its traffic problems. When you say, well, what, you know, Alameda's got some unique environmental issues. I think the biggest is sea level rise, from my opinion. Um, but obviously, earthquakes. Every, it seems like every city in the Bay Area has its environmental issues. We don't have the fire issue like the cities out, you know, Napa have in those areas. Um, essentially, what the state and the region has said is like, look, this is an issue of statewide concern. Every single one of you cities has your own set of issues around transportation, infrastructure, fire hazards, sea level rise, the, the, the in, you know, water and all of you have these issues. That can't be the excuse for not building housing in California. We have to keep allowing people to build housing or else the repercussions for all Californians will be even worse. Um, Alameda, like transportation, let's just talk about that for a second. We have a transportation issue. I'm, I'm a planner, I work for the city of Alameda. Like I am the director of planning, building, and transportation. So it's kind of my problem that I've got to work on. I'm like this, while I'm doing a housing element, I'm also doing transportation. Um, we have to work on our transportation system. One thing that is clear though, we have to stop this sort of chicken and egg conversation. Oh, well, we can't do housing and until we fix our transportation. Like, no more housing until we get the transportation system just perfect, so we all love it just like we like it, and then we'll allow it, then we'll, then we'll do some housing. That argument doesn't work. It doesn't work in California. It's not going to work. The state is saying, you've got a transportation problem, work on it, city. But in the meantime, you can't shut off your land, your supply of land for housing, because that is going to cause a whole other set of problems. What are we doing in Alameda about transportation? I actually think you're doing really well improving your transportation system. You added a new ferry terminal in the last two years. You added a new transit line across your whole city for transportation. Last two nights ago, we were at the council telling them about this new pilot program we're feeling pretty optimistic about, where we're gonna set up a, a free water shuttle between Oakland and Alameda for the northern waterfront, free to anybody who wants to use it so that you don't have to drive through the Webster Posey tubes just to get to Jack London Square. I mean, it's only a thousand feet from here, but you can't get there without driving unless you want to brave that little tunnel path, which you, most people do once and never do it again. Um, <laughs> the, um, but let's just get to it. We hear this all the time. No, but that's not the kind of transportation I'm looking for, Andrew. I need a new bridge for my car. I need to be able to drive my car. I don't ride bikes, I don't use transit. I want everyone else to do that, but I need to drive my car. I need a bridge for my car. That is not happening in the Bay Area. We, the Bay Area is growing. It's grown leaps and bounds over the last 20 years. We haven't widened the freeways. We built a whole new Bay Bridge. We didn't add a single lane. The, the, the state funding, the federal funding is not there to build more bridges. 
I've been working on this issue in Alameda for 20 years now. I've talked to Oakland about bridges. We've had these conversations. And I can tell you, no neighborhood in Oakland is interested in us building a bridge so that we can drive through their neighborhood to get to the freeway. And here's the other piece about it. No neighborhood in Alameda wants you to build that bridge in their neighborhood either. So, and even if we could get the neighborhoods in Oakland to say, yes, yes, build the bridge so you can all drive through our neighborhood and the, and the neighborhood in Alameda was like, yeah, 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 it's fine. You all drive through our neighborhood. Um, we don't have the money in the state and the feds are not gonna fund it. The other thing is even if we did, you get into the freeway, like, you're gonna be in a traffic jam the minute that bridge opens. It's not going to relieve that congestion because the freeway, which you're all trying to get to, the regional transportation, is choking on the cars it already has. So it's not the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is giving you options. That's what the city of Alameda is doing on transportation. You can still drive your car. You can still drive your car. You can do it for the next 20 years. It's not going to be terribly convenient. But if that's what you want, you're going to be able to do it. It's going to be slow. So what we are focusing on is give you another option. Like, the transit options are not great. We're trying to make them better. The connections to Oakland are not great. We're trying to make them better. Getting to San Francisco is getting better with now you can take the ferry. Um, you know, we are talking to BART. Now, don't hold your breath on this because it's going to be a, take a very long time. But ultimately, BART is needs to. That's me. Um, BART needs to do a second crossing. They want to go from uh, downtown Oakland to basically South San Francisco area. It that tube is running right under Alameda, no matter what. We've told Bart, we want an escalator going down to that too. We don't want a big Walnut Creek style parking garage where everybody drives and dumps their car all day. But we would like a 19th Street or downtown Oakland style escalator so that we can get down and get on Bart. You're all paying into the Bart system. You should have a Bart stop. Um, so, you know, we are trying. <laughs> we are. Yes, you know, please. And, and, yeah, and as a city, we just have to keep working on these things. You know, BART, BART lines get built once in a lifetime. So we're trying to put Alameda and we told them, like, we're in your way. Make it out. We certainly don't want your BART line running over the above ground. It's got to be under. And please give us an escalator coming down. So we have a, an open uh, alley stop. But. Um, so it's really two problems. We have a housing problem. We have a transportation problem. We've got to work on both. We have to work on them both simultaneously. Every single new project in Alameda pays money every year to provide funding for supplemental service. That's, how it, that's the money that's funding that water shuttle. Every single person who moves into a new housing project in Alameda and out here gets an, easy, an AC Transit Easy Pass. The concept is this, like, you know what, you may never use it. It may just sit in your wallet, but Jesus, you know, let's make it as easy as possible for people to like, all right, hey, I got this thing. Let me just jump on AC Transit instead of driving. Thank you. Got off track. <laughs> <laughs> we want a BART stop. Yes. That's the yeah. thing. Okay. Um, yes. We have a host of questions that once again are extremely similar. One, so I'll just give them to you in rapid order. And you can address them. One, given the number of units, we have about six questions for you. How does that impact Alameda schools? Will we need to build more schools? Okay. Um, two, how is the city, once again, tied to infrastructure and schools? Another one, do ADU units count as additional housing units given our lot size? So that's that the most But uh, yes on the ADUs. You know, those 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 changes we made in twenty eighteen I was telling you about, like we used to do no ADUs, like one every five years. Now we're doing about fifty since twenty eighteen, about fifty to sixty a year. So what we're telling the state is, hey, no reason to think that's gonna stop. So give us credit sixty a year for the next eight years. So yeah, absolutely. That's a piece of our housing element. And we count them. Um, schools. So the city and the school district, we, we talk to each other. 
they do what's called a school impact fee. They, 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 they talk to the city. They look at the development projections going out 10 years. They determine, well, if all that housing gets built, that's going to be more students. They, the school district determines what kind of additional facilities will be needed given that new housing, what the fair share cost of those new facilities is as a result of the development, and then they charge a fee on every single housing unit that gets a building permit. So whenever any of you come in to build a housing unit in your backyard or come in to build 10 units in, your, in that property you just purchased, you're paying that fee to the school district. So they're building up those funds to deal with the additional facilities that will be needed to accommodate additional growth. Um, okay, we also have uh, approximately eight to 10 questions that I think are city manager related because it relates to um, in a big picture of general fund, soda tax, other items. So what I like to do is put those questions in a parking lot, give those to the staff, Andrew, and then they can respond per the city manager's direction and department because they are not related to the topic of today. They are valuable questions and they need, people have, have asked it, so they clearly would like an answer, but I wanna share with you that's a programmatic policy site which is under the authority of the city manager. So I think so. I'll put those over there. So this set of questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're good questions. What happens to the soda tax money that comes to the general fund? I mean, you know, they're, they're good questions. They're not housing related. <laughs> That's right. That's city manager. Not yeah. there yet. Right. Right. So this, this set of questions deals with one, the environmental conditions on the city, of, the city of Alameda, given the liquefaction topic is a question. Um, and if so, then given the environmental conditions of the city of Alameda, different question, how can the city provide the number of units that the state is asking for? Okay. So it's kind of in that environmental and then given the extreme housing crisis in the Bay Area, how do you maximize the amount of housing to be built here in the area, in the city, given the environmental conditions, given the rate? So we do have environmental issues here in Alameda, earthquake zone, liquefaction, sea level rise. We, th those are real issues. Um, new housing projects are built to modern earthquake codes. All housing built in Alameda now is three feet higher than the rest of the housing in Alameda, mostly. Like if you come out here and watch development along the northern waterfront, you see those trucks bringing in all that dirt. They're literally, we are building projects that can, that are that are designed to withstand earthquakes. Now, look, it, I'm not trying to say that every building that we've just we've built in the last 10 years is going to withstand any earthquake that ever hits. I, that's I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, in the event of a major earthquake, I'm much more worried about the houses that some of you are living in that were built in the 1890s and 1920s than I am about the new units that were built last year. And for sea level rise. Yeah, sea level rise is a real issue, but all the new housing, it's less of an issue for that than it is for those of you who are in those homes that were built before we started thinking about sea level rise. So um, we absolutely um, need to be thinking about that. There was a third question, which I, uh, third part of that, which I slipped my mind. Um, I'm older than you, so don't ask me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. I know. Uh, was, was there another, anyone? No, I didn't think I Oh, yes, Mac. Good. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Brian McGuire, City Planning Thank Department. The other brain in the, in the operation. I'm just the talking head. Um, the, um, yeah, how do we, you know, it's a, so this housing element puts a ton of emphasis on higher density housing. It's a basically saying, look, we are an island. We don't have a lot of land. 
we want to we want to we want to have higher density housing in a limited number of areas on our shopping centers. We don't want 70 townhomes or 70 single family homes. We want 800 multifamily units. Small footprint, get it in there. Small units are better than large units. Why is that? Well, because the demand, the need here in Alameda is for affordable housing and the smaller units are more affordable so there's a big emphasis on let's build housing and when we build it let's not sprawl it out let's keep it compact let's keep it transit oriented let's put it near transit let's make sure we provide transit for those units because we have the space for more buildings in the city we have the space for more people in the city even with the full build out of this housing element, there's gonna be less people living in Alameda than there were at the time of the Second World War. It, what we don't have space for, frankly, is every single new person having one automobile and trying to drive around with it. That's where the space issue is hitting us. So the thing about multifamily housing, it's more affordable. It also generates less traffic per unit. That single family detached home with a two car garage spread out in a suburban format like Harbor Bay. We know this, we have the data. Folks in Harbor Bay drive more than the folks on the main island. Vehicle miles traveled. That's documented. So, it, and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's the design of, their, of Harbor Bay. <laughs> Park Street or Webster Street near the transit in a, in a tighter density, like people live near Park Street and Webster Street, they can actually walk to Park Street and Webster Street for dinner. And if you're in Humber Bay, you can't walk somewhere for dinner. You gotta get in your car, it's not your fault. It's just the way we've designed it and built it. So, all housing units going forward, yeah, let's build it and, and support it in a way that it doesn't force people to get in their cars. It goes back to that transportation issue. Yeah, we, we, want, we don't want to make our transportation system even worse. We want, to, we want to build housing that supports the direction we're trying to go with transportation, which is public transportation, water transportation, more buses, hopefully a BART train. Like, it's no good to get a BART station if everybody lives five miles away and they have to drive to the BART station just to get on BART. We want people to be able to walk or ride their bike to the BART station. Um, that's, so hopefully in 20 years when I'm long gone, people will be like, you know what? Our transportation system is way better than it was in 2020. When Andrew was there, right. <laughs> Things got better immediately. <laughs> Okay, here's a, a uh, another orphan, and I'm going to answer this simply without reading all of it, but essentially, why don't we follow, I assume that means Alameda follow affordable housing law. Um, I would suggest one thing, I'm gonna give this to staff because this looks like a code enforcement issue because there's an address on here uh, regarding a neighbor. So, uh, I, I, I will put this in the, in the parking lot and give it to staff. Okay, you can follow up on that one. <laughs> okay, this is a, I believe this was answered, but there are three questions regarding measure A and more recently measure Z. Okay, and the history and light, but I think people know that pretty well. But there's a second part to this question that feeds into a number of other questions. And that is, okay, we're going through this process. I'm gonna paraphrase. We're going through this process. What do we get at the end of the process? Do we get certified X? Are we in compliance? Will developers build it? If so, how long does that take? I'm just paraphrasing the questions. And then there was another question over here that asks, okay, if we do this, what are our numbers? Where will we be in the next round of Reno? Okay. The, um, I'm gonna do the last one first because it's just a really interesting question. I don't know, but my sense 
having been doing this kind of work for the last too long and you know having a lot of communication with the state of california over many years and just watching what's happening in sacramento with all the new housing laws um i i believe but i could be totally wrong about this but i believe you know the city of alameda's regional housing need allocation every eight years usually hovered around 2,000 units 1,700, 2,000, one, one round it was 2,200. Every city in the country, in the state, this round is like three times bigger. Three times. Um, ours is 5,300. It used to be, our last one was 1,700. And this is every city is dealing with this. Um, and what you hear out of the state of California is like, we are so far behind. Like we've added thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs, but we haven't, you know, for, for every, I forget the statistic, every 10 jobs added in the Bay Area, we, the Bay Area has added one housing unit. Like, okay, now I see what the problem is. Um, so I am hoping that the state has taken this approach of this round, we catch up. This is a catch up round. Um, because quite frankly, if in eight to 10 years, we get another arena for 6,000 units, I mean, I, I, I won't be working here. Um, I, I feel sorry for the guy who's, or a woman who takes my place, but <laughs> I really, I, I'm hoping that what we're seeing is the state trying to use this round to catch up and then so that future rounds can be, um, simpler. Um, there was two questions about measure A. Um, it is contrary to fair housing law. I mean, fair housing law went in in, the in 1968, and, and cities and counties and states all over the country have been, you know, how do you do fair housing, and, and, and how, do we, how, do we, how do we change the way we've done things over the years? Um, it's a, um, it's, and, we, and, we, and in Alameda, we, we end up always, we get very defensive when we have these conversations about Measure A because it's like, why did you vote for that? Or what, why were the people, in the, why did 1970, people in 1970 do it? What were they thinking? And some people say, oh, it's for historic preservation. Or they say, oh, it's because of traffic. Or other people say, oh, no, because they didn't want people of color. You know, who, I don't know. I don't know what, why people were voting for it in 1973. And frankly, I don't think it matters. What matters is what does it mean today to say no multifamily housing anywhere in Alameda. And then there's another piece of it we haven't talked about, which is no residential densities over 20 units the acre, which translates to one unit for every 2,000 square feet of land. So what you're saying when you say that is if you can't afford a house that has to carry the costs of 2,000 square feet of residentially zoned land in Alameda, then we're not interested in building that kind of housing for you. It is exclusionary and it's discriminatory. It's saying, if you don't meet certain income levels, don't come to Alameda to try to find housing because we don't do that kind of housing. Now, a lot of people then take the next leap over to the question, is it racist? And I will leave all of that up to all of you to make those determinations. Because there is a correlation between race and income. But I just stop on the exclusionary and discriminatory. It's, it's like, if you're not of this income level, then don't come to Alameda looking for housing. And that is, in my view, a fundamental fair housing problem that this housing element is addressing. And what this housing element is saying, <laughs> hey, housing element. Um, <laughs> so, by the way, all those of you who think it's good, please call the state and say, hey, they did a good job. Because <laughs> we're waiting to find out from the state whether we did a good job or not. Um, the, um, completely lost. I was, I was going to say something really good. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll leave it with call the state. Uh, somewhat of a sidebar. I know many folks in the audience um, about Measure A, 
because that individual that's going behind that helped to teach me baseball here. My dad is an Alameda High grad. I'm an old Otis and the old Lincoln School grad in St. Joe. So we were here in Alameda during that during that time. So it's um, um, I, you know I I don't think that it's commentary because I'm not staff to say this that it's a very very challenge I've been to work with. And to the best, if staff ask for your assistance in working with us to follow state law, then do whatever we can as a community because there are groups out there, I've worked with jurisdictions, that will bring an action against your jurisdiction for non-compliance. I cannot state that clearly enough. As an Alameda, I don't want my dollars going to a legal group to one, represent what I know that I need to do, and two, if I lose, I've got to pay the other side. I just I just don't want that. So I, I want to underscore the significance of what Andrew had shared earlier. That's just the state we're in, in the state of California. So thank you, staff, on that. The fear of, oh, if you allow multifamily housing, like, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff is going to get built. That's, many people believe that Measure A is what has made Alameda beautiful um, from a physical perspective. What the housing element and the zoning that the planning board has been working on, and we've all been working with the planning team, the zoning changes are huge. But they're all focused on this idea that, yeah, we do care about the form, the physical form of our community. We do like the way it feels. We like the way it looks. We're going to stop worrying about who lives in with how many in, in each building, what kinds of people they are. We're going to stop worrying about whether that building, if the, if the building is the right size, the right height, addresses the street in the right way, feels good sitting on Park Street or Webster Street or out here in Alameda Point. That's what we care about. And we're not going to care about how many units are in it. Frankly, the more the better. Like, we need housing. And small units are good because they're more affordable. So let's stop worrying about things like density and let's focus on building height, setback, lot coverage, the thing and good design because those things are really important and it's okay to regulate that it's okay it doesn't mean no regulation that we get rid of measure a it means no more regulation that is designed to keep certain people of certain incomes out of the community so um, this is not a oh just anything goes from this point on housing element by any means Okay, this is the rapid fire uh, round. Thank you, thank you. Because there's a number of cards that were submitted along this topic. So once again, I'll summarize and I'll just ask you that this is no, the responses are not planning responses. So I think we're in a deposition, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Has the department decided what housing should be at the Harbor Bay Club? There is, the housing element does not include the Harbor Bay Club. It does include the Harbor Bay Shopping Center. Okay. Has the city staff determined what housing would be at the Alameda Landing Shopping Center? We have zoned the Harbor, the Alameda Landing Shopping Center the same way we've zoned the South Shore Shopping Center. Um, we're trying to encourage housing on the Alameda Landing Shopping Center, just like we are on South Shore. South Shore property owners are like, yes, you can count on us. We can do about 800 at South Shore. Alameda Landing is, is they have not responded as, as proactively, so I'm not sure. They could probably, there's a couple property owner there's, owners there who I think are close to maybe doing 100 to 200 units over the eight years. Um, but, you know, Target, they're not going to build any housing. Safeway's not going to build any housing. But there are some, you know, where the health club is and the swim center, that sort of area in that, that corner of Alameda Landing. That's where we think if there's any housing built over the next eight years, it'll be there. Okay, we're back on the planning. 
responses. Oh, good. Not other dumb people. <laughs> so, uh, there are approximately three questions regarding supportive housing. What efforts are the city making and what are their strategies regarding supportive housing? Supportive housing, um, housing which provides support, and very often for the lowest income folks or people coming right off the street, um, the, the folks who are are homeless without without housing. Um, and we're our city council and staff. We've been working very hard on this. Um, we've been working with Mr. Biggs in the back on the wellness center. Um, Woo! This has been when Doug came in in what. 2017, Doug's got, I got this idea on, on McKay, and I'm like, oh God, that's going to be hard. Never in my wildest dreams, Doug, did I think we'd be 2022 and we'd still be trying to make that thing happen, but it's a shame. You know, these are housing for 100 seniors, assisted living for 100 seniors. Like, normally that would get approved in Alameda. Eight, five years ago and we'd all be done. Like, if there was anything that was easy to get approved in Alameda is senior housing, assisted the first seniors. Like, I, I never stressed out about senior housing. That was easy. Senior housing for formerly homeless, five years of fights. Because why, what's the difference? What is the difference? Because they were homeless? Like, all of a sudden there's a label. And now it's a fight for five years. It's still going on. We're going up to Sacramento on August 5th to keep fighting because people keep trying to kill us. It's unbelievable. Um, the little bottle parcel, the city owns a little parcel over by Alameda Landing behind Safeway. Um, city staff from Community Development working on supportive housing there. We've made an effort to do some a, uh, a supportive housing out here at Alameda Point. The formerly homeless um, at the Big Whites. Huge fights. Like it's. There's a stigma around people who can't afford, you know, it used to be for years, through most of my career, oh, affordable housing was the, was the fight. Now it's, if it has anything related to the words homeless on it, it is just brutal. And I just, I'm hoping in three or four or five years, people will start just, oh, a homeless person is no different. I mean, there are so many homeless people who are living in cars that you don't see. Like, not every homeless person is that crazy person on the corner yelling outside my office. It's, these are people just like you living in cars. We have Alameda School District kids going to school at Alameda School District. Their home is a car. Like, this is a serious problem and we've got to deal with it. So, um, your city council, you know, the majority of them have been really solid <laughs> pushing this. It's it's tough. It's expensive. It's expensive and it's hard. But I think the city's doing an admirable job, just not giving up on the fight and just keep pushing because we got to deal with this. It's it's well, it's tragic. Thank you. So these last set of questions. One, I think we've touched upon, but if you care to elaborate, if we pass this, what are the benefits from the a certified housing element, and what can we and future generations look forward to? I think it's, you have kids, do they want to live in Alameda? Can they afford to live in Alameda? Nope more housing, more smaller units, more transit-oriented housing, housing at lower income, you know, that are affordable. I'm not talking about deed-restricted affordable housing. I'm talking about just affordable market rate housing, just an apartment that your kids can go and rent when they come out of college, um, number one. Number two, the supportive housing, like creating more of those lower income units so that when that that senior who's been living in, in some, you know, with on a fixed income, all of a sudden runs into a health issue and all of a sudden can't pay the rent. It's not, boom, now you're out on the street or living in a car. Um, you know, the, the trade-up, the, 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 the need for those rental units and those more affordable units, market rate units that are in our rental. Um, you know, once we passed Measure A in 1973, like you know, all construction of rental housing just stopped. So. 
you, you know, creating more housing at the sort of what we call the sort of the working middle, the missing middle, that lower income for sale product. So that those middle income of uh, uh, residents who are still in that rental unit, they would like to own, they would like to be homeowners, but the jump from what they're paying in rent to what they would need to pay to buy a unit. I mean, since 1973, it was basically, if you can't afford a single family detached home with a 5,000 square foot lot, you're out of luck, go to another city. Um, we need to start building in those housing opportunities. And I think, you know, the benefits, I'm hoping in 10, 15 years, less people living on the street, no more Alameda school district kids, homeless, um, you know, opportunities for your kids and your nephews and nieces to, to stay in Alameda and, and become, I mean, that's what builds community, like generational, you know, being able to stay here and, and, and continue to contribute to the community at the end of the day. And of course, the, the main immediate thing is avoid the god-awful expense that you all are gonna pay with your tax dollars if we don't get this done. Because those lawsuits and those fines that I described at the beginning, those are gonna hit. They're gonna hit immediately. And, uh, and, and that, those budget conversations about whether we should keep the tennis courts lit or whether we should hire another policeman, those conversations are gonna start getting completely distorted by the fact that you're paying millions of dollars to somebody else's lawyers and to the state of California until you finally adopt a housing element. I mean, it's just, it's, because at the end of the day, you're gonna have to adopt it. It's the law. Thank you. So this last round of questions, um, see, what's the best way? Because now we're gonna discuss affordability, okay? So a number of the questions, and I'm going to once again summarize this. Okay, so you go through this process of identifying, you have a certified element, let's say we're all trucking, we're, we're, we're on good stand, we're certified, state says move forward. Then a number of the cards ask, okay, so how then do you build it? Okay, and given the current cost of construction, how is building affordable housing feasible? So now we're talking about feasibility and whatnot, and um, I'll turn this back over to you, because I know those numbers. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually gonna ask um, Mr. Lynch here to pipe in as well, because he actually does this kind of thing. But um, we, um, a couple things. One, focus on, on getting rid of the density standards. So that when uh, somebody who's trying to make a project financially feasible, one of the best ways to make it financially feasible is to allow them to do more units. If they want to do smaller units, that makes the cost per unit less. Um, the other thing is thinking about our processes. Time and expense to get to that building permit is a huge factor in financial feasibility. So what we're trying to do is streamline that process with all these zoning changes that all the planners are working on. So we as a community decide where we want the housing. Let's be really clear about what kind of housing we want, how tall, that height limit, that setback. Let's just write it all down right now. So that when that property owner, or that developer comes in on that property with a project that meets our requirements, we don't spend five years talking about it. You go, you, you, you go hire an architect, bring us a, 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 a good looking design, we'll take it to our planning board. We have, our planning board is really good. You bring us a good design. We're not gonna argue about how many units it is. Does it meet the height limit? Does it meet the setback? Is it a professional architectural design? Good, you're approved. Go get a building permit, go. The other thing that we're looking at is fees. Like cities in California, ever since Prop 13, started loading on fees. Fees, 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 fees. You know, the, our, our city council, we've, I've already started this trend, like taking away the fees, the extra fees, especially for affordable housing. You're doing affordable, deed restricted affordable, less fees for you. So just trying to make it. Big picture, and then I'm turning it over to Patrick, because Patrick knows this stuff well, more than I do, and when it really gets into the numbers. I'm a city planner, I do zoning, I work with the developers, I've never built anything in my entire life. He has. Um, but we, um, we um, you know, it, affordable housing 
in America, affordable housing in California. I mean, we as voters are we're, we're, we're basically saying when we go to the polls and when we talk about taxes, we want affordable housing. But we don't want to pay for it. We don't want to pay for it. We don't we want the developers of housing to provide it on their dime. So the vast majority of the affordable housing that gets built in Alameda are market rate projects where we tell the developer, hey, 15%. Out here at, at Alameda Point, 25% of your units must be deed restricted. So what's happening is the market rate units in the project are subsidizing the affordable housing. What is it doing? Well, the good news, we're getting 15% or 20% affordable. It's just a drop in the bucket of what we need. But the market rate stuff is now more expensive. Now more expensive. So it's, uh, from my perspective, at some point, we as taxpayers and as a society are going to have to start thinking about whether we want to start putting our tax dollars into the production of affordable housing. Because right now we're just saying, hey, Mr. Developer, you do it, you do it on your dime. Hi there. This last card I was just handed, our community benefit, a benefit of new development. And then there's a series of, of, um, of car valves with question marks, such as new parks, water shuttles, more transportation, infrastructure, every, et cetera. Everything that was discussed here is that a part of a benefit package back to the city? And I will assume as part of a new development. Person that brought that, I assume that that's what the question was. Just real quick, the um, new part. Yeah, yeah. Product. Yeah, so we, look, we, we, we do with every project in Alameda, um, public benefit. Obviously, housing is a public benefit, but what else? When we're redeveloping property, whether it's Alameda Point or the Northern Waterfront, every single project and a lot of our new land that's being converted from old industrial or military um, to housing it is along the water so it, it's a great opportunity every project waterfront parks every project along the northern waterfront we require water shuttle landing because we know we want to be running that water shuttle i said earlier every project since 2006 in alameda there's a deed restriction that says hey every property owner needs to pay couple hundred bucks a year towards transportation so we have an Alameda Transportation Association that then that account is getting bigger and bigger so they're providing subsidized tra transit passes so transit parks um, obviously they're building all the new infrastructure for that that for that uh, project and in Alameda Point they're building the infrastructure that supports all of Alameda Point so every new development is providing public benefits that all of us essentially benefit from. Great. Okay, in terms of, of costs for a unit, um, without getting into the weeds, because I can show you spreadsheets, we, we provide capital to developers, we provide capital to mitigate risk, we provide not only the equity, but also the debt. So right now we probably have, um, we have a significant amount in the California market. Uh, one of my partners, we've managed about 7,500 units throughout the state of California. We have uh, other projects um, that we have underwritten for municipalities. Um, so we're very pleased with that. So we know the numbers, we work with our senior, and the numbers are the numbers. So what I like to do for individuals, now that I'm on the private side from the public side, is that I ask you to familiarize yourself because I can't believe what it costs to live in California from having grown up here. And does anyone know what the current medium income or even a 120% medium income for family four in Alameda County? You are absolutely, you are very close, $150,000. That's, that's incredible. I tell my daughter, okay, you know, this majoring in philosophy, sweetie. Okay. 
Yeah. So my wife already said we're going to convert our garage. You didn't hear me on that. No. She's going back to her old room. He's going up. Yes, he's going up. But the point is, is that it's not just single family homes detached. It's how do you build, how do you finance that building for and make it such that families and individuals can live there. So it's like taking a Rubik's Cube and bringing it together, but there's ways to do it. And um, without being cheap, and I'll say that. So we build something for if we were living. So all of our staff live where we build. It's our philosophy is very simple. If you're not gonna live there, then you don't bring that to, to the market. So fortunately we're able to do that. And that's why the, the other side is that I just find that it is um, incredibly irresponsible of jurisdictions to allow individuals to come in and provide a product that people are not pleased with. And you have every right to hold developers accountable, say here's the value, here is, here's the raw material we want. This is the look that we want. And I think it's just it's just fabulous. So to that extent, I'll have a sidebar conversation with folks. I can give you all the numbers. And I just think you need to be prepared for what it actually costs to build housing because we've got to get this certified by the state of California because we do not want to go down that path of litigation. We just, we just, we just don't. So... Um, Go to the county website, familiarize yourself with the numbers, and um, thank you, Andrew and Seth. I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, I think it's, I just wanted to just recognize a few people. I'm hoping some of you will hang around. I'm going to have another beer. If you want to talk anymore, let's, let's do it. Um, well, I just want to recognize, uh, you may have seen a guy in a uniform. Our fire chief, Nick Luby, was here. He had to leave. Um, our community development director, Lisa Maxwell, is over there. If you want to know anything about Alameda Point... <laughs> oh! No, are you all right? Um, if you, Lisa, if you're interested in what the city is doing about supportive housing, about the homeless <laughs> situation, and about Alameda Point, um, Lisa knows it all. Um, our public information officer, thank you, Sarah Henry. Sarah's around here. If you want to know about what's going on in Alameda, that's, that's the woman you talk to right there, because um, she knows everything. Um, I also just want to take a minute, um, if they're still hanging around, they are a source of information for all of you, or if you ever run into them. Our planning staff, which has done so much work on these issues over the years, we have a, a small planning staff here in Alameda, and most of them are here today. Every single project, every single plan that's done in the city of Alameda is basically coming out from these guys. Um, Alan Ty is our city planner. Alan knows everything about planning. He's worked for you for, what, 15 years? Um, Deirdre McCartney, that Deirdre right there, every single second story, every single second unit, every single design review that's done in Alameda, and that's a lot, she does it. Brian McGuire over there, planner extraordinaire, also transportation expert, um, does a ton of work for us. Um, Aaron Garcia, Aaron, Aaron does everything, keeps the place rolling, and Nancy McPeak is around here somewhere, probably getting a beer. Um, <laughs> Cisneros, oh, Ciamara, where, there she is, planning board member, Next time you see that project, you're like, hey, who approved that? I'll be like, she did. <laughs> um, Patrick Lynch, you know, Patrick, thank you so much. Patrick, my, my eight pleasure. years on the planning board yes. a while back. Thank you. Really, uh, one of the best planning board members we've ever had. So, and, and Alameda resident. So just fantastic to have people like this in Alameda. I also just, um, if I missed anyone, um, thank you, Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Um, thank you. Now, Chamber of Commerce came to us, you know, eight months ago and was like, hey, this housing issues, we think that's important. The business community cares about it. 
you know, what can we do to help? And we kind of together came up with this idea, let's get out and talk to people and let's do it with, in locations of local businesses. So spend some money inside and support our local business who provided this space for us. It's kind of nice under here. I thought we were all gonna get sunburned. So it was good, <laughs> it was good. Um, and uh, let's see, I think that's I think that's it. Oh, and then Becca. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Becca, who pretty much knows everything about Alameda. And if you want to know anything, just ask her. So thank you all for coming. It's really been great. Um, hang around, talk housing. Thank Have a nice evening. Woo! It was very good.